So my family is composed of myself, my wife, uh, I have a little son who's uh, 21 months old and then one on the way. Um, and it's pretty much all localized as far as, uh, as, far as where my family is. Uh, you know, I have a brother that's close to us uh, who lives in Rancho Santa, uh, Rancho Santa Margarita. But for the most part, everybody else is in uh, Arizona, Northern California. So uh, it's unfortunate for my wife who has to deal with raising a young one and another one on the way because we don't really have too much help. But uh, we do have my brother and, and his wife here. Uh, but very close-knit, very tight family, and, and they definitely come before basketball to me. So from a basketball career standpoint, it was never my first sport. So my first sport was, was soccer, and I love playing it. I got amazing footwork from it, and I can really attest a lot of what I can do on the basketball court because of my soccer upbringing. Um, and then uh, I played you know, recreation, uh, recreational basketball all the way up through, through high school, and that's when I started to get into the AAU circuit. Uh, I was even skinnier and even wider uh, when I was growing up, so it definitely was, uh, was a pitfall in my game, but I did a couple things great, and that's what I got noticed for. So I was able to play on, a, on, a, on the Oakland Soldiers when I was growing up, uh, going through the high school circuit, and then from there, got the opportunity to, uh, to play at a, the collegiate level for UC San Diego, where I believe I still hold a few of the scoring records, so I've got to hang on to all of them that I can, because I know it's soon going to be whittled away from me. Um, and then I, I ended up playing basketball professionally uh, when I got done with my four years there um, at UCSD. And uh, I played, I had the opportunity to play, uh, play a little bit for the, the Reno Bighorns, uh, the NBA G League at the time. And then um, like from that you know, couple weeks that I was there, I got an opportunity to play in New Zealand. Uh, so I played in New Zealand for a season. And then I played in Mexico to finish up my professional career. Uh, and then it kind of led me to this. You know, it took a little bit of the, uh, of the joy and the love out of the sport when I was overseas and and you know I found my passion I found my niche of basketball training when I came back my last season and that's how my career kind of started out of thin air. Me getting into the basketball training world was very organic. Um, what started what was kind of like my, my ignition switch was uh, I was working at our gym at, at UCSD checking people in and I grabbed the card, checked them in. The next person that came up she, it was, it was an older lady, and she asked me if we gave basketball lessons. And I said, no, but I'm on the team so I can try it out and see how it is. And I approached it like you know, my college coach did with a little piece of paper that was super monochronic, had five minute intervals, so it changed every time. And I put it back in my belt loop just like he did. So it was very hard structure, and I focused a lot on, on what we did from, from a college coaching standpoint. Uh, but I really found my passion is that you know one client kind of progressed and, and grew to two, two to four. Uh, I found my passion with teaching, so not so much the basketball side of it, but just teaching and understanding that you can impart some of the wisdom that you have and what made you successful in your life, and you can see them grow and utilize it and ex achieve and experience that same success. And that was so much more uh, influential and so much more important and. and and uh, you know, to me, then playing a basketball game, and you know, and, and that's where it really kind of took form and took shape, was before I even realized that it was a career. So daily routine on a consistent basis always involves filming content, which we are in the age of edit, where you are constantly having to put your best type of content, best foot forward throughout that content. So we're constantly filming. Uh, we start typically around 7 or 8 a.m. We'll have professional sessions year-round, so even now we have pros that are still either recovering from injury, ACLs, uh, they're coming from surgery, uh, they're off, you know, off season because their leagues are at a different time, there's veterans who just want to do it to stay in shape. So we'll always have our pro workouts in the morning, Monday through Friday, and then we'll go up to either go up to LA to see a couple of clients or an individual, but Typically it's pros in the morning and then amateurs in the afternoon. So I'll have a break around 11.30 to two and then come back two to about 7.30 where we're rocking with our amateurs uh, and filming content you know, through little pockets of the, of the day. Uh, embrace the ugly. So we like to say, you know, embrace the suck. You know, it's so easy for, for a kid to go out on the court and, you know, get get down on themselves for making a mistake or to hear one of their friends bicker at them because they did something incorrectly and they kind of get out of this you know out of this you know, out of this you know into this habit where 
They become all about the performance, not about the actual process. And we love to tell our kids, like we had a great session last night where we told everyone, like, stop the session, said, you guys suck. And then we started smiling and laughing and just said, you guys need to understand that this is a great time for you because you guys are going to be able to grow so much more through this session because of the advancement, the, the need for, for growth that, you know, that you're experiencing. Like you guys are so rudimentary with the, with the thing or with the, the skill concept and that should tell you something. It should tell you that there's so much more room for growth. So embrace the suck, embrace the ugly. Don't shy away from the, the, the fear of, or don't embrace the fear of, fear of failure. Just understand that it's a process and if you continue, you're, you stay consistent with you know, your development, you're gonna get better. So what, motivate, what motivates me the most is, is my faith in my family. Uh, I was raised with a strong Christian faith and, and that's something that you know, gets me up every day because I, I feel like this is my vessel, this is my opportunity to, to kind of share God's light and to, to showcase how I live my life. Um, I've been put in some, some crazy situations, I've, been, I've dealt with some crazy things in my life that, and every single time like God has me you know, survive from it and strive from it and, and that to me is like, I know, I'm, I know my purpose on this earth is bigger than the game of basketball. So, so basketball, the teaching side of it is my vessel uh, just to showcase to everyone that there's more to it than a silly orange ball going through a silly orange rim. As far as goals are concerned, we live in a very evolving market for basketball trainers. So any person that establishes a 10-year goal, a five, 10-year goal, is probably gonna be so far off the mark you know, when they have, you know, reassess after a couple of years. So, so we try to stay as loose structure as possible with understanding, you know, benchmarks. So, so we'll have benchmarks with, you know, for our fiscal growth, we'll have benchmarks with, with uh, clientele numbers that we want to, want to attain or, you know, certain things we want to do from an online performance side of it or, you know, an encore performance side of it. But uh, for the most part, if I was to give one hard goal in the next three years, it'd probably be to have our own facility where we function and utilize it as a transformation type of uh, facility where we have a one-stop shop, similar to what we have here, but make it more of like that J-Law B-Ball branding. So I like to help players understand the game-like aspect of it, game-like training of it, by focusing first on internal. Uh, so we focus on the individual skill set and then being able to implement those individual skill sets into the game-like actions. So cadence and, and all the timing and tempo of the sport is so hard for players to grasp. And we have this unique age right now where there's so many trainers out there focusing on individual skill work that it becomes very easy just to get lost in the shuffle and focus only on internal or individual development. So now it's, it's really important time for players and kids to understand that you know the individual development is phenomenal, the skill set side is phenomenal and we need it, but we also need to have that fine balance between individual skill set and game enhancement, game development. So understanding how to utilize everything that you've worked on to increase your box within the structure of your offense, the box of your offense. So that's something that's extremely important is understanding how to develop players and you know from that game enhancement setting. You know, Dr. Dish has made so many huge technological jumps over the past couple of years, and it helps us because, you know, as we talked about, you know, this industry is evolving, you know, every year, and Dr. Dish has done a phenomenal job of staying ahead of the curve by giving us the necessary tools for our players to get that game-like action. So being able to get into the proper cuts, lifts, and drifts, and be able to move and utilize, you know, the Dr. Dish without physically or manually, you know, going out there and adjusting the, you know, the direction of the, of the throw, the toss, and then being able to track the statistics. Like we are in an age of analytics where everything is based off of statistical performance. And now with the Dr. Dish CT, it gives you statistical you know, analytics from each spot, mid-range three, and mixes it up and breaks it down to where you can see where your struggle points are. And from a development standpoint, that's something that's so important. Because we as like an individual, if I'm getting out there with a player, with a client, and it's just me, there's no way I'm remembering what their percentage was from mid-range three and a different spot on the floor. And this helps me throughout that process of really getting a fine-tuned detail on where I need to focus my time with each, in each individual that comes in front of me. Yes. I did have a player that I idolized growing up, and I had a couple. 
The first was Allen Iverson. I loved how gritty he was, and he was polar opposite from me. I was a frail, very brittle, you know, human being, like growing up, very thin. And he kind of epitomized what I thought, you know, elite basketball was. Opposite of me. I wasn't that confident in myself. He epitomized, he, he exuded the confidence. And then uh, when I got to high school, so it was all prior to high school, when I got into high school, uh, Max Preps did an article on me, did a write-up on me in my freshman year, and said this kid is an incarnation of, a reincarnation of Manu Ginobili. And from there on, I wanted the Friar cut. I wanted to be balding in the back. I loved the slashing mentality. I loved how he played. It was super fluid. It was super Euro. And at that time, that was when like Euro-style basketball really started to come into play. So I picked up on that wave, and I really rode Manu out for you know, the remainder of his career. Uh, if I wasn't working in basketball, uh, I would probably do something on the, entrepreneur, on the entrepreneurial side. Uh, I started out my first company when I was in high school. Uh, I then parlayed that into, you know, from a property management company into a private investment firm, from a private investment firm into, you know, uh, a home and remodel company. So like, entrepreneurial, my entrepreneurial demeanor has kind of been established because of my father, and he did a phenomenal job of raising myself and my two younger brothers of learning how to you know, to be self-sufficient, to be self-made. So um, I was very fortunate with my childhood and my upbringing and, and the, the morals and the ideals that my, my dad left me. Um, so I think I'd be set because business kind of excites me and intrigues me. So anything that, you know, that, that makes dollars and makes sense to me. Yes. The Pew Pew Crew is a movement that should have never been started. I said it completely jokingly about three years ago, and my brother is, is a gun fanatic, he's, a, he's a, a marksman, and that's one of the slogans that they have in the marksman industry is, is Pew Pew. So we were coming out here and I had a couple of really, really amazing shooters, three-point shooters in the gym, and after each shot I would just yell out Pew Pew, Pew Pew, and I thought that they would just laugh at me and we'd you know just leave it at that. And, I was doing it just obnoxiously all summer, and when we came back the next year, they, the guys, the same guys, same group of guys said, hey, you know, who's part of the Pew Pew crew? And I was just like, what are you talking about, man? Like, that was so last year, like, that was done. It's like, no, we want it, man, we want it. So it kind of stuck. It was something that never should have, never should have stuck, but, but we ended up catching wave, and, and now we, we consider anybody who can shoot the ball extremely well that comes into our gym a member of the Pew Pew crew. So we're a privilege uh, to have Dr. Dish be a part of the Pew Pew crew. Oh man, the best hair in the game, DJ Sackman. Tops, hands down. I don't know how he gets it to where every single time on an Instagram story, it might be the duck lips that when he does it that makes it, you know, accentuate the hair flip, but it's just, he always has that perfect bang that's flopping. He always knows how to Flick it back at the right angle, like the the, the lighting is always is always hits it always hits his head. Per Whatever it is, man, it's working for him. I applaud him at the same time. I hate him for it, um, but I would uh, I would probably consider myself a close second in the hair industry just because Mike Dunn has none, and uh, a lot of our guys are are, are on the the decline. <laughs>